Hello. Hello, esteemed guests and friends, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on what is a beautiful springtime day in Vancouver for this third session of Ethics for UBC, where we focus on ethics in policy, business, and law. By way of self-introduction, I'm Roland Nadler. The distinct honor of serving as your graduate student moderator today has fallen to me in part because I am a PhD candidate in the Allard School of Law here on UBC's Vancouver campus, and in part because I have, over the past dozen years, variously been a graduate student within, research employee of, and a persistently familiar face around Neuroethics Canada. At the outset, I'd like to invite everyone to join me in thanking the president's office for supporting this important initiative and in graciously recognizing members of the organizing committee for this series, Dr. Judith Hall, Dr. Judy Illis, Dr. Paul Van Donkelaar, Louise Harding, Marianne Bacani, and Anna Nectarline. To ensure the duly informed participation of all present in this session, it must be emphasized that the organizers will be using the Zoom recording function. So we encourage everyone to approach this space and participate as a limited public forum. In a moment, I will hand the mic to Dr. Michael Burgess to introduce uh, the session, but not before dutifully introducing him in turn. Dr. Michael Burgess is pr Professor and Research Chair in Biomedical Ethics at the University of British Columbia at the W. Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics in the School of Population and Public Health and in Medical Genetics. He is Associate Provost Strategy for the Okanagan Campus. His research extends public deliberation to policy issues related to pandemics, biobanks, AI and big data, the genetic technology CRISPR, and theoretical work on concepts of diversity. Dr. Burgess, I'm honored to yield the floor to you. Thank you Mike, very much, Roland. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome and thank you all for joining this panel discussion on ethics in policy, business, and law. To begin with, I would like to acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and UBC's Okanagan campus is situated on the territory of the Silk Okanagan Nation and their people. As our audience members may be joining from several places, near and far, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands as well. Ethics and Policy, Business and Law is the third installation of Ethics for UBC, a five-part series of panel discussions organized, as you heard, by Dr. Judy Ells, Dr. Paul Van Donkler, uh, Judy Hall, and graduate student Louise Harding. The series aims to explore and strengthen ethics scholarship and education across our Vancouver and Okanagan campuses. These discussions are for you, our audience, students, researchers, faculty, and alumni, to learn about the current landscape of ethics at our university and opportunities to be more involved. In my, and believe it or not, 26 years at UBC in the research chair in biomedical ethics at the Morris Young Center, um, the fields of applied ethics have expanded from topically oriented considerations of ethical theory and sciences to more political and equity oriented research and, and learning. I had the opportunity as principal of a college for the College for Interspersory Studies to see how ethics is woven into areas such as forestry, just for example, and climate change. And now as associate professor for strategy in the Okanagan campus, I see a real strengthening, including this series of the interdisciplinary and bi-campus engagement in ethics, and very encouraging to see this, this kind of growth in the area. Today, our exceptional panelists will share their insights and experiences with ethics across a variety of disciplines, from Indigenous law and policy to sustainable entrepreneurship and ethical business practice. I will now pass it back to our moderator, Roland Adler, to introduce our panelists and kickstart the event. Thank you. Much appreciated for those gracious remarks. Now, let me orient us with a word on structure. The session will begin with about 40 minutes of roundtable discussion amongst the panelists, following from a trio of prompts. After, we will have about 10 minutes of general Q&A from our audience members. 
Then our panelists will be given a final prompt before the structured portion of the event concludes at 1 p.m. Pacific. If you have further questions and would like to continue the conversation in a small group setting, you're invited to join a behind the scenes breakout room with a panelist of your choice uh, from 1 to 1.15 p.m. You're welcome to bring questions we did not get into in the open session or new ones during that time. With our agenda set, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our four panelists. We begin with Professor Patricia M. Barcascas, who is Métis from Alberta. She is an associate professor of teaching at the Allard School of Law and academic director of its Indigenous Community Legal Clinic and Indigenous Legal Studies. Her research focuses on the intersection of justice and law, including access to justice, clinical legal education, and decolonizing and indigenizing law. If you'd like to welcome our panelists with the, the clap emojis and the Zoom function, that's, that's one way I very much encourage. We next turn to Lerato Chondoma, who hails from the Batuan clan Baja Moletzan from the nation of Lesotho and is the associate director for the Indigenous Research Support Initiative in VPRI at UBC. She also serves as vice chair for the Racial and Ethnocultural Equity Advisory Committee for the city of Vancouver. Her work focuses on enabling co-created strategies for researchers and communities to tackle complex ethical questions through a decolonial and anti-racist lens. She holds an LLB from Rhodes University and an MBA from Simon Fraser University. Dr. Grace Fenn is an Associate Professor of Sustainability and Organization with the Faculty of Management at UBC Okanagan. Her research interests are Indigenous-led sustainability, inequity, entrepreneurship, institutional change, and social innovation. Her interdisciplinary community-based research informs policymakers, practitioners, and communities about best practices in sustainability, entrepreneurship, and reducing inequity. Alphabetically last is Dr. David Silver, who holds the chair in business and professional ethics and serves as the director of the W. Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics with a joint appointment in the Sauter School of Business and the School of Population and Public Health. He studies how we should think about the for-profit corporation from a normative point of view with a particular emphasis on the proper role of the firm within democratic society. Panelists, thank you so much for all being here. Let's have one more round of emoji applause uh, for, for this fantastic and esteemed panel. Panelists, as I said, you will be presented with three guiding questions for our discussion today. To allow enough time for each person to speak, I'll ask that you please limit your answers to about 90 seconds each, after which I will engage in the solemn moderator's duty of uh, tentatively unmuting my mic and interceding to steer you to a conclusion with utmost kindness. To begin, your bios have already given us a preview regarding your areas of interest, and I'd like to invite each of you to offer greater detail on the issues at the heart of your research and thinking. We'd be especially glad if those details were to include who shares those interests of yours at UBCD and UBCO, as well as what opportunities there may be for students and others to be involved. I think I will begin in reverse order of my introductions, assuming I am not catching anybody too unawares, and uh, pass the floor over to Dr. Silver. <clears throat> Thank you, Roland, and thank you, uh, everybody uh, who, who helped uh, organize this session. And you can hear me okay, give me a thumbs up. Uh, excellent. Thank you. So, uh, as you said, my, my uh, area of specialization is in business ethics. And the kind of the big issues that I think about are what is the role of business in society, and especially democratic society? And uh, along with these questions, there's different ways of framing it. It's, you know, for example, what is capitalism? And can we identify a capitalism with a human face? Uh, for example, can we find a way to create jobs that are suitable for human beings across our whole economy? And more generally, how do we create an economy that works for everyone in society? 
And just by my, my particular area of uh, interest is thinking about the for-profit corporation. What is it as a metaphysical and normative entity? So that, as a philosopher, I come to that and, and think about how to situate this, this corporation into a society, a democratic society that works for all. Just finally, to your question is who's interested in this question at UBC? Who's not interested in this question at UBC? Uh, and uh, I actually had a student uh, a few years ago do a survey, and she came up with 290 names of active faculty uh, who had some interest at the intersection of ethics, business, and capitalism, whether it was pro-capitalist, anti-capitalist, so on and so forth. So there really is a wide range of people interested in this issue, and uh, I'm happy to talk more about it. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Silver. Next, we'll continue the reverse order and move to Dr. Fan. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for organizing this wonderful uh, panel discussion. Uh, my research interests are generally in the field of um, sustainability, uh, inequity, and uh, entrepreneurship. These are the three broad strands. Um, the first two, sustainability and inequity, are mainly related to indigenous nations. Uh, that's uh, somehow it developed. It actually developed through, um, prior to coming to Canada, I didn't realize in the existence of indigenous nations. Uh, it was only after I arrived, uh, I realized that was the case through where I'm based in the Okanagan, the Silk Nations, uh, so I have lived and traveled to other nations, uh, Nicola nations in uh, in the area, and also the nations uh, in the Chilcot nation, as well as the uh, the indigenous nations on Vancouver Island. I have lived and worked uh, in the indigenous community and worked there, and uh, so I feel very fortunate in the sense that I get to learn and experience the way they live and uh, learn about the land, learn about their, what really struck me was the value system they had it was entirely different from the, the typical Western uh, system. And it's through that uh, I, I built up, up the research, uh, gradually expanded to inequity because for me at the end of the day, it was about uh, social equity, the historical structural inequity, economic inequity, and as well as, well as the knowledge inequity, because, you know, the, it is not, uh, the, the ecological uh, knowledge system is, is just different, but they, the way they know the land, they live on the land, so they actually influence the way sustainability should be done, so to speak. Um, so that's my, uh, the people who share my interests, uh, at least in the Okanagan campus, I know Dr. Janet Armstrong. She she does uh, she her research is on the indigenous knowledge based system, so we have that conversation, and uh, also I actually also branched out because I've approached by other indigenous nations uh, through uh, outside of Canada. They actually want to do what uh, some other peoples that they do in their own country. So, so like a network of scholars. And I also know some indigenous scholars who may, they may not do the business side of the things, they may do like law or knowledge, but that's hopefully something to build up. Thank you, Dr. Fan, and perhaps some opportunities for students and later remarks. As a relative newcomer to Canada myself, I share your sense of gratitude at these learning opportunities. Uh, we'll next move to Ms. Chandoma. Thank you, and um, thank you for having me here today. Um, for the purposes of the discussion today, I'm going to focus on the area of my work that really speaks to policy. So how community-led ethical frameworks are influencing global, national, and regional policy and legislation, and how our institutional policy intersects in those spaces. So thinking about how we're collaboration with Indigenous communities, racialized communities, marginalized communities, and other communities at intersections of identity, 
These collaborations present complex and ethical questions for researchers, community, staff, and, and leadership at UBC, where there's no roadmap and there's no clear one right answer. So often it's a choice between right versus right, where each alternative is the right thing to do, but there's no way to do both. So how doing the right thing leaves another right thing left undone, essentially. So some of the faculty colleagues working in these spaces on both campuses with me, um, and please, this is not an exhaustive list, but those I've worked with most recently and in intensity with most recently, Mary Ellen, Paul LaFont, Cheryl Lightfoot, Margaret Moss, Helen Brown, Elizabeth Schaefer, and Handel Wright, uh, Shirley Chow, who's over in the UBC Okanagan, and some community-based practitioners and staff who include Jean Ruiz, Susan Grossman, and Kathleen Leahy. Ways in which students can get involved, I think, is really for us to invite students to co-create and to reach out and see if we can have them sit on adjudication committees, on leadership committees, on, on research committees, and also ask for this type of ethical discourse to, to sit in our business policy and law courses, but also for us as practitioners to work to generate instructive case studies that can then be used in the classroom. Wonderful, thank you. And finally, we'll move to Professor Barkaskas. Thank you. Uh, uh, Patricia Barkaskas, Dashanika Shan. I'm joining you today from the territories of uh, the Cree and the Blackfoot and even some Anishinaabe here in uh, what is Red Deer, Alberta on Treaty 6 and 7 and uh, also the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, ethically, it's important for me to also point out that I am on my own home territory where I am accountable to my family and to my community. Um, here as well. So I think that um, in the work that I do at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic, which is located in the downtown east side, um, I'm looking at the ways in which we are accountable and responsible to the Indigenous community, not just the Indigenous urban community in that particular area, but to Indigenous people, communities and nations across British Columbia, and indeed across what is now called Canada. Um, students are involved directly in the work that I do in that they actually do the work on the ground at the clinic. We host um, 10 students per semester who come into the clinic and are trained to serve clients. So in doing that service work for Indigenous clients directly, um, the ethical issues that students um, come, in, come in contact with constantly um, are something that are part of their everyday learning at the clinic. Um, and then they translate that and take that into the work that they do um, and sort of trying to undo and decolonize the idea of um, legal education and legal practice and policy work. Thank you, Professor Vercascus. The description of the clinical work resonates with my own clinical experience in law school and it's much appreciated. Moving now from the general to the specific. What are some particular cutting edge ethical issues in your area of interest? If you prefer, within the legal and ethical bounds of confidentiality, you may wish to answer by sharing the story of an ethical dilemma that you have encountered in your own experience or practice and how you addressed it. Whether you wish to answer in terms of a story or uh, speaking to concrete issues, uh, let's begin um, continuing the reverse order, but staggering it by one uh, with Dr. Fan. I'm keeping you on your toes, I apologize. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm in the field of management, so I'm trained in organizational theory. Uh, so within the field management, uh, it has moved um, to increase the importance to see to for researchers to look at um, what we call grand challenges or societal problems. Uh, so probably we don't have the label to say it's ethics, but for me they are all ethical things. They are all have deep moral undertones. Uh, for instance, uh, how do you deal with uh, you know? environmental sustainability, how do you with, deal with poverty, inequity, uh, homelessness, um, like, uh, you know, so all of these things um, within the field of ma management, now there is a, really a push for researchers to engage with those deep, entrenched, really difficult societal problems to actually to address it, to, to do research on that, on these subject areas and try to, to 
uh, to answer them. An example being inequity. Uh, I'm talking about it because I've I'm just writing about the research on that. Um, the existing ones usually actually talk about how uh, those marginalized, those disadvantaged groups or people or actors actually alleviate the symptoms of inequity. How do they actually cope? But uh, more, for me, but the more important thing is how do these actually marginalized people can actually rise up? How can they actually come up with solutions to deal with, to, to reduce inequity? That is actually more important. Then uh, there are research talking about, you know, you, with the facilitation of NGOs to, to in, institute a program to do that. But for me, the more important thing and more cutting edge thing would be actually how do these marginalized people actually do that? And I have actually come across the wonderful people, indigenous people nation on Vancouver Island who actually did that. And I know it is still an ongoing work. So it's just to overcome the entrenched inequity, you need a lot of work and the work is still ongoing. And uh, for me, that was, uh, really, uh, that's the cutting edge thing that really I encourage more research to do. And I also, talking about opportunity for students, I am actively looking for students <laughs> to join me on these uh, research projects. So especially if you are from Indigenous nations yourself, I welcome more. I have many collaborators who are Indigenous people, but they don't necessarily want to do a degree, a research degree. So, but they are like uh, my port of call. They are they are the people I I vote. Uh, but um, okay, have I asked? I think I, I think and more. It's it's quite appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move uh, continuing our rotation to Ms. Tondoma. Um, I think I'm going to focus on the, the kind of critical issues as opposed to an example. <laughs> um, so as practitioners working in this space, we're realizing that some of the emerging community led ethical frameworks are inconsistent with some of our institutional frameworks, policies and processes. So while our institutions begin the work of reconciling some of these inconsistencies, many researchers, communities, staff and even our leadership find themselves caught in these gray areas where there's no one right answer. And some of these gray areas in research and scholarship spaces include research, uh, relationship development, when to engage, how to engage, who to engage, the ethics of pre and post research projects, our obligations around knowledge mobilization, the issues of consent, individual versus collective consent, prior and free prior and informed consent, withdrawal of consent, <laughs> um, ownership of information and knowledges, again, the idea of individual versus collective ownership, and then the recognition and centering of alternative ways of knowing and doing and how these are measured and evaluated in our academic systems. Um, I'll, invite, I'll provide a, a couple of uh, examples of community-led ethical frameworks. As it relates to Indigenous research, we have First Nations principles of ownership, control, access, and possession of data. We have the National Inuit Strategy on Research, principles of ethical Métis research, as well as nation-led community-driven research protocols. We have Indigenous-led human rights frameworks like the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the BC Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples being adopted into federal and provincial legislation. And all of these are informed by Indigenous nations with distinct worldviews and cultural context and values. We're also seeing racial minor mar minorities mobilize and articulate race and ethnicity research considerations, ethical considerations. Other vulnerable groups like the communities in the Vancouver down, downtown east side have developed their own manifesto for ethical research in the downtown east side, guided by their lived experience, cultural and social value norms. And so we really find ourselves in the institution at this time of global and national reckoning. The number of unmarked graves continue to rise. We're grappling with anti-Black and anti-Asian racism, Islamophobia. So what is our work to co-create strategies in the institution to answer these ethical questions while advancing an intersectional equity approach, but also making sure that we're pushing through fairness and justice in all the work that we're doing? Thank you for crystallizing those uh, so nicely. We'll move now to Professor Barkaskas. Thank you. Um, so I think that the at the heart of the ethical issues that um, 
my work and the work that we do with students and the work that we do with clients um, in the legal context who are Indigenous specifically, um, it's really about accountability and responsibility to stories. Whose stories are these? Um, so when we work with Indigenous clients, and I think that this applies across the board in terms of research period, um, the idea of who's who's the expert in the room is a really important one. And it's really hard uh, working with law students sometimes to um, really help them recognize that ethically, their job is actually to be of service rather than to be the expert. And that that is, I think, at the heart of the ethical challenge of bringing law students into contact with Indigenous clients who are who are then in contact with the Canadian colonial legal system. Um, the undoing of the normative violence of legal education that creates a culture of expertise and a culture of um, the, the person in the room who knows everything and who has the answers is a really difficult one to undo. Um, and again, I think, it's, I think it's an applicable ethical dilemma across most of what uh, universities and institutions do, right? They establish expertise in the um, exalted framework of the researcher or the legal expert or whatever that may be. And then, and then it's a process in decolonizing and indigenizing that process to walk that person back from that perspective and undo the, um, undo the knowing of that, right? And, and getting people to start to question their own positionality and expertise. These answers continue to build in thematic harmony and I'm so grateful for all of them. Uh, finally, Dr. Silver. Great, thank you. Uh, I wanted to bring up two issues that that's in my work and also uh, kind of connects with things you see in the news. One is uh, you increasingly see business leaders, including the business roundtable with hundreds of uh, business, business leaders saying that businesses should have a purpose in addition to the pursuit of profits. And what they leave deliberately vague in these statements is what's the relationship between purpose and profit? How do we put those together? And that's one of the things as, as an academic, as, as an ethicist, we can help provide guidance to these leaders and to everybody else who's involved in the business world of how do we put these together? What's fundamental? Uh, a second thing that's in the news uh, and that I work on is the relationship between um, uh, business and democratic society. So you get issues, for example, the, the recent so-called don't say gay bill in Florida. Businesses need to respond to this. Take, for example, Disney, which has a major presence in Florida. How are they thinking through their response as a company to this new law? Or with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you're seeing company after company both being called on to make a response and making responses. How do you respond to these situations? Or more locally, when we had these, you know, so-called freedom convoy here, this implicated business as well. GoFundMe, a company, received 10, approximately $10 million in donations, and they had to figure out what do we do? Do we send it on or not? This is a case where thinking through the values and the relationship of business and society will be critical for making these kind of decisions. Thank you all so much for those answers. Uh, Building now, uh, bringing this crescendo into the question that, that really tees up the biggest vision. Each of us brings to discussions of ethics, implicitly or explicitly, a notion of betterness, a vision of what more robustly ethical practice looks like and how to facilitate its emergence. Would each of you please speak on your vision of better? How can we get there from here We'll start with Ms. Chandana. Um, so I think really what we want to do is create space to explore what it means to be successful in our roles as researchers or leaders and community partners, but as well as facilitating us to be thoughtful, responsible human beings while navigating these complex relationships and add, you know, an added filter of decolonization and justice and anti-racism lenses. So I think many of us working in these gray areas are faced with difficult, deeply personal questions um, that are shaped by the many intersections of our identities, our race, our gender, our culture, our religion, our ability or disability. 
And they'll often ask ourselves questions like, do I have to leave my values at home when I go to work? Or how much of myself and what I really care about do I have to sacrifice to advance in my career? Like who, when I get to the office, who am I really? And I think understanding that all of us are grappling on how to navigate these gray areas, these right versus right conversations as our full, whole, authentic selves with multiple accountabilities as Dr. Barakaskis was speaking about in and out of the university. So with all of this in mind, how do we create ethical climates within our institution where these values are supported and understood? And how do we ex explore these ideas of trust and culture in these negotiation settings? So first, representation matters. Despite the clear influence of cultural identity, cultural context, and different worldviews shaping this area of ethics scholarship, the most dominant practices and policies are still in a Western paradigm and Western view. Um, we need to create and open up pathways for marginalized voices who are impacted by these gray area ethical decisions to have equal access to decision making and leadership tables. The idea of nothing about us without us that originated in disabilities activism, then went to the black civil rights um, movements to now indigenous self determination and sovereignty activism, ensuring that these voices shape the design utility and mobilization of this area of ethics scholarship is essential. We also need to recognize that there's no one size fits all model. It just doesn't work. And this is not a zero sum game. So we're all not created equal and we're not starting from equal starting points. How do we create space for this personal, cultural, and social values to form part of our ethical, practical consciousness in our institution? Um, a way to build new knowledges and understandings is to develop case studies, I feel strongly, because it'll share some of what these right versus right ethical dilemmas are, what some of our practical co-created strategies look like in specific contexts. And then we really need to think about co-developing distinct approaches for indigeneity and indigenous-led frameworks, for racial justice, organizational justice, social justice frameworks, where representation from all these marginalized communities is, is, um, is uh, ensured. Thank you. I so appreciate how you put that. Next, Professor Barkaskis. Thanks. I think building off of that, um, I, I can say that it's really about how we do what we do, right? It's it's about the way that we we practice, but it's also about the way that we live, right? It's about the way that we come together as people in community um, to be accountable and responsible to one another. And within the context of the university and research and um, engaging with communities outside of the university and researching with those people and for those people in service to them, I think that it's important that we recognize the way that we, again, situate ourselves. And our, our, pers our personal situatedness, of course, comes into that 100%, um, as, as was just you know highlighted so beautifully. But and um, the way that we position ourselves as, again, the, the, the people who come from the institution or from the university context into that relationship. So I think that if we focus on the fact that these are relationships and we deal with them relationally, um, so that we're in conversation, in discussion, in dialogue, and recognizing that, again, we're not, we're not the experts. We don't, you know, people are experts in their own lives that, our real role um, coming to this work is to be of service to them in whatever way that means, if we're talking about um, working with communities. And we have to figure out in that relationship then where our accountability and responsibility lies outside of the parameters of the project when it ends or the parameters of being a legal advocate, for example. Um, these, are all, these are all pieces of the puzzle, I think. As my own PhD supervisor is apt to remind me, think first of the relationship. Next, Dr. Silver. Great, thank you. Uh, so my own role and main role, professional role in trying to make the world a better place is, is as a teacher. And I, I teach primarily business students to take on an important social role and, and analogously to how you know, a law professor trains them to take on that important social role of the, 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 the lawyer. And I see my role first to help them open their eyes, to see the, all the ways that business impacts people in positive and yes, negative ways, the ways that people are vulnerable uh, across the world to our activities. 
And then once the eyes are open, there's a little bit of emotional management because that can lead to guilt and helplessness. So I mean, this is what we do and what can I do about it? And really to turn that over to how do we empower our students? How do we connect them to good examples, to mentors, to communities of practice, of people who in organizations who do better? And then in that way, we can create the sense of empowerment that we can do better. We don't have to accept the way things are done and ultimately to make our social roles ones that are positive uh, rather than to be caught in this chain where we just do negative things without the ability to do better. And rounding out the stirring replies to this question, Dr. Fenn. Okay, um, within the field of management, and now there's an uh, increasing uh, push for what we call responsible research. Uh, in the sense, uh, the research not only uh, an important and urgent pro uh, societal problem, but also the research has impact, but not only impact in terms of the impact factor for research, but also actually how it impacts on the organization and the people, uh, i.e. the subject of your research. Um, so for that, I think uh, this is important because um, I have heard uh, people say, uh, I come from a practitioner background. So before I actually worked in the real world, <laughs> I call it the real world. <laughs> anyway, um, so I have heard people say, nobody reads any research, your research paper, ordinary people just don't. But it's actually not necessarily true. To, or one of my research projects, I actually looked at uh, in the Okanagan, uh, uh, a very well known, actually, uh, a water stewardship council in the Okanagan, which has a good uh, reputation, in, not only in Western Canada, but in, in North America in general. But uh, when I was doing that particular research during the, the period that I had, um, the, the council went through a, a dip, so to speak. Uh, so I, 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 I had my own dilemma in the sense because I know the people and I, and I see them all the time. So I had to make a, a decision whether to be true to what I observed and what the people told me. So I did that. And uh, to their credit, not to mine, they actually read the published paper. They did something with it. The organization took two years of work. They actually reversed that. So they did, they did things because they, they, some of the things that the members told me, they didn't necessarily told, uh, told the, the leadership. So, but the leadership decided they all did it. They, the council all came together all the people, they all, they, they basically made it mandatory for them all to read the paper and they actually did something. It took them two years to update that. And that was immense for me. For me, that was like the greatest satisfaction for me. And I didn't realize they actually did it. But when I, you know, took a break, when I went to the council to attend these meetings, I realized they did that. Uh, so that was uh, for me, uh, I think earlier, we're talking about case study. So I actually make it as a case study for my students. I ask them what they would do because the, the, the study um, ended at a point when the council was going through a low period. So I asked my students what they would do. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so I'm just uh, encouraging more students and more researchers, everybody really to do the things which a meaningful for, for them and really honor the, the voices of the people that you observed and you interviewed with because they actually tell you the truth. And also I wanted to emphasize on the relationship side uh, for the, that particular research, I didn't do any interview until six months after I have attended the meetings. That really built a relationship. And I, I didn't go into, I actually didn't go into that project wanting to do research. I actually did went into the project because I wanted to help the local community <laughs> because they told me in, in the Okanagan water is, there's water shortage. So I attended that. I thought, oh, maybe I could help in whatever way. That's how I started it. Only 
six months later, I realized, oh, this is actually could be a research project. So that's how I did it. Purely by accident, but just being me. <laughs> I'm an, an introvert, so I'm really shy. I can't <laughs> struck a conversation <laughs> like most North Americans do. So uh, that's how I did it. But but that that actually helped. <laughs> so just do the way that you are comfortable with. I think and that's the important thing. So that's the that's what advice I would give to to any of the, my students. Wonderful. Thank you so much to all our panelists for a really inspiring round table. If I were at liberty to expand my PhD supervisory committee by four people, I think I know who I would email first, but alas, I'm full up. Uh, I appear to have overshot my moderatorly duties by about five minutes, uh, which is purely good news. It means that we have five more minutes for audience Q&A. So what I will encourage audience members to do is either in the chat um, or excuse me, by way of raised hand, at least to begin lining up questions that you might like to get to. Uh, and I'm, what I'm going to begin by doing um, is uh, taking first from the chat a question uh, from Dr. Judy Illis, one of the organizers of this event, um, having to do uh, with, well, I'll read it, uh, besides OxyContin and COVID vaccines, uh, what are major ethical issues in business and health today, Dr. Silver? Ah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Judy, for knocking off the two things I would have said first. Uh, one of the things that I think about and I actually I think is very important is the issue of pricing. So if we're taking the perspective of the pharmaceutical companies or device makers or, or practitioners is what do we charge? And uh, especially when there's intellectual property involved in, in people will pay anything or societies will pay anything to keep people alive. And it puts pressure on a whole system of how do we continue to be able to provide healthcare for everybody in an equitable manner when there's more and more opportunity to, to uh, uh, charge whatever you want. We're going to have to figure out a way of allowing companies to still get their profits, still get their incentive to create, but still allowing a society to provide equitable access for everybody and still provide for education and public health and all those other great things that we need. And I think that is the ongoing and will be increasing uh, issue for business at the intersection of health. We've had a question in the chat uh, from Stanley Lee that I've been thinking about uh, now since it was, was posed because it brings up an important theme that was present in all of your answers that our ethical practice unfolds against the backdrop of existing structures in society and structures that have power holders. So Stanley Lee asks, uh, how much does the philosophy of power holders have to do with how capitalism works? And you know, if, you're, if in your answers you want to address other societal structures and structuring ideologies as well, I think that would be apt. Uh, that's a question really that I'm happy to throw to any of our panelists. Could you just give us one little bit of that question again? I, I missed. Uh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, given that uh, we're doing, we're, we're trying, striving for ethical practice amidst the backdrop of structures in society like capitalism. How do we how do we engage with the fact that it is often the philosophy of those who hold power that determines those structures? What does that mean for our own ethical practice? Yeah. I, I'll take first shot here and then really invite a fellow panelists to to think about this. But the way I think about uh, ethics. I mean, there's different ways of thinking about the world. There's, and there's different ways. So some people see the world in terms of who has power and who doesn't have power and how do I get more of it, right? And, um, or there's another way of thinking about the world where you look and you see uh, just who has it, who doesn't. It's just as purely academic. And what, what I do ethics, it's an imaginative exercise of how do we reimagine the world such that it works for everybody. And of course, some people will have more power in some ways than others and other people, but it's gotta be a society that works for, so it works for everybody. So it's an imaginative exercise that is, again, comes in with open eyes. These are the ways it doesn't work for everybody right now. Start there and then let's make it better. Maybe I can jump in here and, uh, and move to, um, you know, not like the imaginative is, of course, so so much of the important work that we do in thinking through ethical dilemmas and issues, absolutely. And I love imagining a world in which 
um, legal systems actually represent justice <laughs> and justice for those who have the least access to justice at this point in time. Um, and so in the in the very real world situations that we deal with in terms of representing Indigenous clients within the Canadian legal system, um, you know, a lot of the work that we have to do thinking about the power structure, you know, um, that is the legal system, the institutions that go along with it um, is how do we decolonize and indigenize that work and create true systems of accountability and responsibility in a system that is so deeply flawed um, and doesn't actually provide access to justice to the most vulnerable? Um, you know, students really struggle with the, the idea that the work that they're doing continues to not be enough, right? That it That is, no matter how good the work is, it never, in their eyes, like that one case, that one person's life doesn't change the entire system. Um, so we have to sort of take a step back from that, I think, and, and think about the ways in which every, every piece that we do within that structure that resists, that pushes back against it, that creates new and generative conversations that lead us in different directions is a part of undoing the work of that system and or at least questioning the power and educating people about the ways in which that power operates and how that operation means that it doesn't work for some people. So long as I am not preempting anybody else's answer, uh, we do have a, a question from Anna Nechterlein, one of our, our organizers who is, as I think many of us are, very interested in this concept of a, of a right versus right dilemma, um, and, and particularly in plumbing, some examples of that. I will give pride of place in answering this, this to our panelist who introduced the, the concept, but I'd be interested to hear from others following that as well. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just use a really practical uh, example in the research space um, around co-created knowledges and uh, who owns those co-created knowledges and, and what to do with those knowledges. So in the academic enterprise, you know, that is researcher owned, researcher driven and researcher right to publish. Um, and we have policies, research policies that support that um, and encourage it. And we actually evaluate and reward that, that structure. Um, in indigenous uh, community-based uh, ethical frameworks that are emerging, you know, that authority about what happens with indigenous knowledges, you know, who, how it's owned, who owns it, how it's reproduced, um, you know, sits with indigenous um, nations and communities. And some have articulated very clearly in their protocols and frameworks. And, you know, we have the emerging, um, well, not emerging, existing principles around First Nations data and OCAP. And so when a researcher is sitting in that middle space, right, of, um, of trying to navigate perhaps a community that has very clear ideas of what, what can and cannot be published and who has authority to speak to that knowledge versus, you know, pursuing tenure and academic progression and publishing. It's a, it's a really difficult space to be in when wanting to respect and build ethical relationships in good ways, um, as well as advancing you know why you're here the reason you exist in the university and so i don't have a right answer for that but what i'm trying to put forward is we need to understand the complexity um and and the the different ethics charged in that conversation and we need to create space where we allow for that conversation to honestly and authentically be held right and so that means challenging some of our institutional norms about time and time orientation how long it takes for these conversations to happen about um really looking and revisiting how we evaluate and define success um, for academic progression where perhaps publication numbers and volume don't look the same as other disciplines. So I think it's a it's a whole systems approach that we need to take where we have these and support both the community and the researcher in those conversations. Others on right versus right? Uh, okay. Please go on. I'm not sure this is uh, rights versus rights, uh, the, the, the straight answer. I just would say what I do. Um, uh, for 
all of my research, I was actually introduced uh, to the Indian leaders or elders. So I, I got to know them. And uh, I actually never went to any of the, the nations with the view to do research. <laughs> uh, my conversation, because my, my prior working background, I worked, uh, uh, so uh, one of my research is entre entrepreneurship. And uh, what are my conversation with them is they all, Indian nations, they were interested in a, a developing a, a conservation economy, a diverse economy. And they wanted to build their own capacity to, to be more entrepreneurial. So that's how they were interested. So of course, I basically shared my knowledge and you know we have discussions. And it's through that conversation, sometimes it actually develops. And then I got to know the, the, these nations, their people and what they did. That's, then I realized, oh, actually that's something could, could do with, with the research. Then I just approached, that's how I do my things. Um, plus, I always one thing I always do is after I have collected data, analyzed it, uh, I wrote the findings. I always, throughout the process, I actually I actually send my findings to them. In the sense, I want them to fact check. I I said, you know, I I want to make sure my interpretation is true to what you experience. I don't want anything to be wrongly interpreted, and they love that. They are, it's like um, something's really small, like how they would like to be addressed. Like some, you know, because even in, in the broad, uh, broad sheet, in like newspaper media report, I see them, the nation was shortened to, to like, uh, just like three words. And I realize they don't like it. <laughs> they like the, the whole thing. So it's just really small things. Uh, so that's what I do. Of course, I sign all the whatever necessary agreements they require me to do. Uh, but I acknowledge it takes time. It's a relationship building thing. You you really need to earn their trust. It's, uh, you know, the core concept is uh, re uh, reciprocity. So it's like uh, there's a, uh, there's of that. So that's really, that's just no way around it. And I wish um, the people in the power, within the power in the system, in the university, the, the administration who are populated by, I'm sorry to use this term, old white men, I'm, I really hope that they understand these difficulties, these, these energies that you, you needed to get these things. Uh, we'll have Dr. Silver and then I'll pose one quick question and we'll move uh, into the next part. Yeah, I, I just want to address this idea of right versus rights. And that, that comes up in my own work where uh, I look at uh, the law where it's assigned in many places corporations having rights, whether they're rights to property, rights to political engagement, rights to religious rights, which we're even seeing in the US. Um, and, and how do we think about these? And here there's really a connection between right and rights. And what I argue is that how we think about corporate rights has to be attached to imagining a world, what assignment of rights is going to make a world that works best for everybody, right? And when we figure that out, then we know whether to treat an individual or a corporation organization of having rights. So I see them as deeply tied. Thanks, Dr. Silver. I am uh, I'm constrained uh, by our 1255 uh, uh, limits to prioritize among the several good remaining questions in the chat. I will pick the one that is most cross-cutting uh, amongst all panelists, and it comes from Max Cameron, uh, who asks, how do you teach ethics? Indeed, can it be taught? A provocative one to end on. Maybe, maybe I'll jump in uh, first, but I just want to say, you know, the first thing I would say is whose ethics, right? Like, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about ethics? And I think maybe that's the first step in teaching ethics, right, is to question the very idea, you know, where are we coming from? What are we talking about? You know, whose, whose perception of that are we dealing with? So I know that for me, in the work that I do teaching, starting with that curiosity is always a good place and and then also thinking about the idea of good citizenship instead of maybe ethics in a traditional sort of for lack of a better context western paradigm 
Thank you. Others? Yeah, maybe I'll build off that um, because I feel very strongly that us as ethical beings are shaped by where we come from, you know, who raised us and and who we're accountable to. And I, I, I struggle often when we're in spaces talking about ethics because there's a very narrow prescriptive view of where that comes from um, or what that is. And it doesn't accept that we all are shaped by our cultural, uh, some very deeply our cultural origin and who we're from. So I think we're more trying to think about how we create spaces for those different uh, knowledges, views, uh, ideas of ethics to, to be in really robust conversation. And then to, to the training, I think the piece is to, to deprogram our bias, right? For when we hear that, to call it something that's, or, or, or invalidated or call it something that's not valid, especially in our academic setting. So I think the training is again around like conscious bias, unconscious bias, and how to do uh, cultural, cross-cultural integration, conversation, dialogue, and then I think the ethics and a collective ethics can emerge from those conversations. Thanks so much to our audience members for their excellent questions, and I will very, uh, with regret to those to whom I didn't get, uh, we of course have the breakout sessions uh, for just that purpose. I have one final, you might call it a lightning round question uh, for our panelists. Building on the many rich themes drawn out into today's discussion, if you could share one resource with us, a book, an article, a podcast, what would it be? Uh, I will return to the alphabetical order in which I first introduced you and begin with Professor Barcasas. And I, ap I apologize, but I'm going to resist um, because I can't pick one. I just can't. Um, there's so many resources. And I think that the really important thing is, at least for me, when I think about this question is, where are you? Who, like for me, whose indigenous territory are you situated on, right? Find out where, or where did you come from, right? Like, where's your family from? And what, what, if that's in Canada, like what indigenous territory here were they situated on? And then find somebody who writes from that perspective or a resource from that perspective and find out more about it because that's really important. So, you know, if we're at UBC and we're talking about Musqueam and that's sort of your main perspective, you know, have you have you been to Musqueam? Have you checked to see if you can visit? Have you gone to the cultural center? Um, how do you engage with the community that is the host nation of the place that you are? Thank you. Yes, a resource can be a place, of, an experience. Uh, I'll let that answer it. Uh, let's next move to Ms. Chomdoma. Um, mine is a is an oldie, but I think it's still <laughs> a goodie for my um, days in, in uh, the business school where I was co-designing a course with a faculty member. And uh, the book is called Defining Moments by Joseph Badaracco. And it really kind of introduced this idea of right versus right dilemmas for the first time to me. But it's a really practical book that gives um, some flexible frameworks to think about what it means to make management decisions and choices, not only shaping your career, but yourself as an ethical person in those situations. So um, it is old though, but I still think it's really valid. Next, Dr. Fan. Okay, I will share an article written by Clayton Christensen, who is a professor at Harvard. Um, I was deeply moved when I, in my 20s when I first read the article. It's called, How Would You Measure Your Life? And I, for me, every year as I, as I grow old, mature, I reread it and I learn more things. I, I reread it and I learn more things. And he is a remar remarkable person, really, um, who, who is, a, who is a, a acknowledged expert on actually innovation. That's his but his article is profound. Um, I mean, he re, his recent passing was, you know, at, it made me to like reread that. Uh, but I also have, uh, because I research sustainability, I wanted to introduce two books on sustainability. One is called uh, Flourishing, a Conversation About Sustainability. Now, the, the concept in that book is remarkably, remarkably similar, the striking similarity with the indigenous nations I'm familiar with. It, taught, it was just remarkable. Um, he, the author is uh, one of the four really front runners about sustainability for a long, long time. 
Uh, the other is actually called, provocatively called the end of sustainability. <laughs> it's also to moving the conversation towards the ethical space, i.e. Which, which part of the paradigm are we talking about? Whose ethics are we talking about? So that's my bit. Thank you, Dr. Fan. And if I can encourage uh, everybody who has uh, given resources that have associated hyperlinks uh, to drop them in the chat, we will also uh, collect all of the recommended resources and uh, post them to the Neuroethics Canada website. Let's turn it over to Dr. Silver to conclude this lightning round. Yes. So uh, one of the things I've, I've done in my own teaching, at least, is move away from theory and ethical theory and, and incorporating at least a bit arts and humanities. And one of the things that I found very uh, helpful and has come from my students is a, a recent documentary called The Social Dilemma. You can find it on Netflix. And what it, it's about Facebook and other social media companies and the, the power and the promises and pitfalls that they present for human possibilities, for, for being human beings. And it really raises a lot of issues without necessarily trying to solve them. Uh, and I think it's really, uh, it would be an effective tool for getting people to think about how do we manage these new technologies and how can we do it in a democratic and equitable fashion. Fantastic, thank you. Before we move to the optional behind the scenes breakout sessions, I'd like to thank Dr. Michael Burgess for his opening remarks our distinguished panelists, and of course you, our audience members, for attending. The fourth session of Ethics for UBC focuses on ethics in health and is coming up on April 27th. You'll each receive information about the next panels and a very brief follow-up survey to further the goals of the Ethics for UBC series. For those who will conclude their participation here, thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a pleasure.